All right. Well, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Kevin Sykowski. Uh, I'm a geography professor from the University of Toledo, or maybe I should say my home in Temperance, Michigan. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, the BWET program, NOAA BWET, and water quality, and what you could do to help your uh, watershed. So I'm going to um, share my screen and get us started here. All right. So our, uh, and of course, everything is usually slow for me to go into PowerPoint mode. <clears throat> now it's all dark. <laughs> it's the way it works. So we have uh, Drew will be speaking. Let's see, I'm still loading. <laughs> So I'm somehow, it, oh, okay, so my PowerPoint crashed. So anyway, maybe we'll go to Drew first, because you're the sp first speaker, I think, right, Drew? Uh, I'm not quite sure. It looked like I was second, but I can Oh, go. so was Abby first? No, oh, no, you were first, Kevin, and then Drew well, was know. second. Okay. Well, I know, but my PowerPoint just crashed on me. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll stop sharing uh, my file folders, and uh, I'll, Drew, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, and then... Uh, okay. You can take it away. No problem. Thank you. Hold on here. Doo -doo -doo. Okay. Don't know why it looks like that. But hi everyone. Um, my name is Drew Mark Wilson. I work for Defiant Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, and this is my first time being on a webinar, first of all, and also meeting all of you. So um, bear with me. I think it'll be fine. But, oh. And so, um, I, this is difficult because you guys are in the way. <laughs> Let me put you there. Everyone can see? Yes, thanks. So Defiant Soil and Water Conservation District, um, we are a county-based organization, um, and our mission is to protect land and water of Defiance County by being an advocate and assisting in educating the public to make best choices to preserve our natural resources. And um, like I said, my name's Drew. I'm the new education and outreach coordinator at the district. Um, before that, I was a former AmeriCorps alumni and my host site was at a conservation district in northern Michigan um, and I'm from this area. I'm from Buckley, Michigan and I went to school way up here in uh, Marquette, Michigan and I went for environmental science. So there's a little background on me and conservation districts are really unique organizations. Um, since we're county-based that Seems like it wouldn't be a big deal, but we're the only county-based organization that works directly with the federal government. So if you think of um, uh, NRCS, that's the federal side of what we do. But we get to be um, directly working with county entities and then um, right up to NRCS. So um, conservation districts were founded in 1949 mainly because it was uh, a big movement after the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Um, and conservation districts are uh, staffed by the state and county professionals. And there's, uh, we're the one out of 88 in the state of Ohio. So what we do um, when people are come up to me and ask uh, what's a conservation district it's very complicated because we do so many other things just like the word conservation is so broad as well so we talk about uh, soil erosion we do inventory and um, for pasture land woodland um, we we assist in um, conservation tillage and we even rent equipment for that stuff um, we have our own nutrient management specialist 
on site to assist in managing um, manure and nutrient runoff um, complaints. We uh, build erosion control structures. We have our ditch maintenance crew, um, tree planting, all that good stuff, pond clinics, and of course we do education as well and outreach materials. Um, before I get into uh, what I do as an educator, I just want to do a little background on water quality. Um, obviously, water, qual or water is our natural resource. We all need it. Um, and things that can th threaten that are uh, point source pollutions or non-point source pollution. Point, for point source pollution, probably a lot of you already know. I'm just going to briefly go over. An example of a point source pollution is PFAs. Um, those are chemicals used in industrial settings and they're contaminants that don't break down and so that can be a concern um, for contamination. Um, but we know exactly where that comes from. That's why we call it point source pollution. Non-point source can be um, sediment getting into our water, nutrient runoff, um, toxic compounds and heavy metals um, from urban settings, um, different pathogens, but giardia and um, hypoxia, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, what we're looking for when we talk about water quality, um, we test for temperature, dissolved oxygen, uh, pH levels, turbidity, not tubidity, and uh, phosphates and nitrates. I'll tell you why we test for those things. Um, and there's two ways of testing water quality. There's direct tests, um, chemical tests, and uh, obviously you would test for temperature. And temperature is important because um, that could increase the ability for algal blooms to form and the process of eutrophication to uh, speed up. It's a natural process of, the, of a lake or water body aging. And it does happen naturally, but when the temperature rises for any reason, um, that could speed up the process. Um, dissolved oxygen, um, that's important to test for, especially for all those who live in water. Um, pH, more acidic or basic water can have um, various um, problems in our water. Uh, turbidity, I don't know why I kept putting turbidity, but turbidity, uh, that could um, cloud up our water and that also causes temperature to rise too. Since there's less um, surface area or, or surface depth um, causing it to cool down towards the bottom, um, it heats up the water, like I said, allowing eutrophication to happen faster. We test for phosphates. Um, those are catalysts for uh, algal blooms and eutrophication and growth of those kinds of things to happen faster. Um, just like a, like a fertilizer and nitrates aren't good for us and people with um, compromised immune systems to have in our uh, water that we drink. Um, so we can test those things directly and get an answer. Um, an indirect way to test for water quality would be um, collecting benthic macroinvertebrates. And um, this is something that you would do over a large span of time in order to conclude on the health of the water. Um, but how it works is there's different indicator species like mayflies, caddisflies, you'd collect those if they are present, absent, or abundant, that'll give you a reading um, on what kind of water you have, you're dealing with. Um, so there's sensitive species, semi-tolerant and tolerant species to pollution. So what I do, I have the awesome opportunity to go into classrooms 
And I also do adult workshops outside of the schools as well um, and camps. And I get to talk about all the cool things that I love. And this is one of my favorite topics. So what I've done is I've broken up each grade level into certain levels so I can build on um, each topic that we talk about. Um, but when it comes to water conservation, um, level one is my K through first grade. And in those grades, um, we talk about more of how water quality can affect wildlife and their habitats. Um, so we talk about wants versus needs. Um, we all ne need water and um, we talk about water words and kind of the whole cycle and habitats as well and what those look like for animals. Um, a big one that we talk about is dragonflies and they need the habitat um, near the shoreline and that's why we keep tall plants near the shoreline. And so fun activities, especially for the little ones. Um, level two, I have second through fifth grade and we talk about um, different kinds of pollution, soil erosion, um, adding sediment to the water. Uh, and this cool table I have here is called the streamulator. Um, so they get to figure out how to um, secure the soil in order for it to reduce the sediment that ends up at the end of the stream. Um, and then for third grade, I have erosion boxes. So they test what, uh, ero how erosion happens. So they apply wind, rain, uh, waves, and they have to secure the soil too. So level three um, is sixth through eighth grade and um, they are very much into water quality testing like we talked about and uh, the direct and indirect testing. So we, right here in this picture, we're looking for benthic organisms. Um, and a fun activity I like to do, especially with the more, uh, I guess the eighth graders, is a sum of parts. So what they do is they all have a sheet of paper um, and on the edges of their paper are shorelines and each one of the students draws what their perfect property would be. I tell them they have a million dollars and they also were given this land, what would you do with it? And then we end up putting that stream together. And once it all adds up, we talk about how they could have um, potentially added to the pollution of the water and usually we can find something on each property and they end up passing down their little tokens of what res what uh, represent uh, pollution and that ends up at the end of the stream obviously and we talk about that so that's a fun activity just to know that we're all part of um, that pollution it's easy to uh, point the finger, but that's a good eye opener. Um, and then we have a cool experiment of how we would um, filter out pollutants in the water and we talk about soil being the best filter. And uh, high school, um, I like to have them uh, work together, maybe building a solution to um, pollution to our water or um, this cool box that I have, it's called the Augmented Virtual Reality Sandbox. And one of the, I think one of my favorite activities is that we build a dam and the scenario is that the dam breaks and there's a village down below, it's about to break I should say, and they need to figure out what they need to do in order to prevent things from eroding eventually, for, to save the town, to keep their water still usable because there's going to be, um, everything's going to wash into it. So they have to build levees and all kinds of stuff. So that's always a good activity 
for a roundabout way of talking about watershed management. And they do testing as well. And um, we talk a little bit about careers and how um, you can be watershed managers as well and what that looks like. So um, you um, can be involved as well. As educators, um, you can always apply uh, water quality programs to your classroom or um, my services are always, always available to all age groups. Um, and if you're not in Defiance County, then that means that you have another soil and water conservation district in your county too. And they most likely have an educator. Um, as global citizens, we can think about um, how our actions actually involve a lot um, bigger area than just us. And as county residents, um, we can take advantage of all the wonderful water that's around us and we can get involved with cleanups and litter prevention. And as producers, there's always programs out there um, such as a program called H2 Ohio, which allows you to get um, paid for services um, such as putting cover crop on your land. Um, for implementing manure in safer ways. So um, those are always things for you guys to look into. And yeah, um, if you have any questions for me, I kind of ran through that quickly, but um, yeah. Well, Drew, you did a great job for your first webinar presentation. <laughs> Thanks, and I've been here, I should say, I've only been here four and a half months, so. Oh, wow. um, I'm still learning the area and all these, all, there's a lot of people to meet too, so, so Ohio's uh, new to me. <laughs> right, and, and did you say you went to Northern Michigan University? I did, yep. Yeah, so a professor from there, uh, Mitch Klett, is on the call right now. Oh, okay, hi. <laughs> hi <laughs> um, so there's a question in the, the box Ooh. from Ann. Do you have any of these lessons available? I do, and um, especially during this time with the coronavirus, I'm making it all accessible online through Google Classroom, and I'm still putting them in. Um, I have one out already, but yes, these programs are available, and I hope to have um, train the trainers kind of workshops. Um, a lot of the things that I use come from my head, and also, um, PLT programs and Project Wild programs. So these are always great and I hope to offer these over the summer depending on how this all plays out. But um, these, will, these will be available and I can always get you in contact with um, workshops in the future. Great, thanks. And then uh, Mitch uh, says he has question, a question. Okay. Mitch, I, I'll unmute. You. Oh, yeah. yeah, I got it. Okay, okay. I, I just trying to figure. Out. I'm I'm still new to this Zoom, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go on for 15 minutes before somebody will stop me and say we can't hear anything you say. Um, so yeah, you answered my question when my question was how how do you get your materials and do you bring all the equipment to the schools. Uh, because that's really kind of the, the, the point up here. It's like, you know, I want to get my, my, my students involved with getting out into the classrooms more, but if they don't have any of the equipment, and, you know, what are we going to do? So Absolutely. like that was a pretty impressive stream table that you had. A yeah, table. I wanted to pull out all the stops. I had to put the cool pictures on, but I have um, things that don't really require a lot. Um, like I was talking about the sum of parts. They're literally laminated sheets of paper that have a blue section on the edge of the paper and they draw up their property. And then I made little tokens. That's, and that's literally what I bring to classrooms. Um, but the idea is there, their creativity, it makes it fun, it's still there. Um, but I get your point and 
that is always difficult, especially to get kids outside the classroom. And I tell you to take advantage if your schools do have school forests, um, take advantage of those or local properties in that way. Because usually there's something that's not always broadcasted. Um, there's always grants out there too for busing. Um, I know in Michigan they have Wheels to Woods programs so that would allow your students to um, go to nature preserves and centers like that um, for free. Okay, I don't, I, I deal with the pre-service teachers I'm at Northern. Okay, yeah, so I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm sorry, Mitch. <laughs> that, that's okay. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't have much time to work with my students, so I can't do a full-blown lesson like that. I can go outside and look at the trees and go through that process, mm -hmm. but the extensions and, and doing all those activities, I, I just don't have the time for that. They can go out there on their own, but then I would have to give them the equipment, and th that tends to be a little bit more difficult, especially in times like this. I'm doing my rock and mineral unit right now, and we got cut off before they could get any of their materials. So That's now they're doing it all virtually and it's not, it's not good. <laughs> so as so. far as the virtual thing goes, I'm learning too and making the most out of it. Um, and those are, we're such hands-on people. We're in natural resources. This is, <laughs> this is wrong, you know? Um, right. But we're figuring it out. But when I, I guess I can help in a way of, when you are in classrooms and you don't have time to prepare um, a whole bunch with materials and stuff, there I, there are tons of programs out there that don't require all that stuff. You don't have to have a streamulator or a sandbox. So, um, and these books are so great about that. What is, so you're teaching college age students? Yeah, I'm at Northern. Right, so, um, I guess there are programs out there that don't require a whole lot, even for older kids too. Yeah. Adults, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I get it. And I, I, I want my guys to go outside as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, we're in the middle of winter and in a lockdown. Normally in the winter, we, we don't have any field trips. I've worked with um, Matt Zika over at the NOAA station down the street. Yeah. And uh, he's been pretty good, but you know, um, they're that, users. About, they should be able to get out. <laughs> yeah, but the, the six feet uh, rule is is a little it's a little hampering for us. Yeah. So we're we're doing what we can. How okay. long have you been gone? Uh, from from, from Northern. Uh, I graduated in two thousand eighteen. Okay, so it's still the same. We don't have anything new. <laughs> right, right, yep. So um, if I can help anyway, I'll try to put together some ideas and I'll get back to you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to mention, as Drew mentioned, is there's a county agent person in every county, as far as I know. Is it, Drew, is that correct? Um, every county in Ohio, yep. Yeah, and I, well, I think other states as well. So because it is uh, federally funded. Um, so if, you know, I know there are a number of teachers from uh, def the defiance area on the call, but there's also people from around the country. Um, you know, there is somebody near you and, um, you know, that we can Always. maybe, you know, make a connection with those people. One thing well, I wanted to mention is that um, I did create a Facebook group called uh, classrooms for conservation and I add a ton of resources on that and I can even add a few names that you guys can reach out to all over the state or even in Michigan too so great well thanks Drew yeah so our next speaker will be Abby Smith and Abby is a teacher at Hilltop um, it's like high school junior high school high school um, I had the pleasure of going out there and uh, doing stuff with her kids, so water testing in the fall. So Abby, you're muted right now, let's see. I can unmute you, I think. Unmute nope. now. Oh, there you go. There, am I okay? 
Yep. Okay. So as Dr. C said, I'm Abby Smith. I'm a uh, teacher at Mill Creek West Unity Schools. We are about 10 miles from Michigan, about 10 miles from Indiana, way over in the Northwest corner. Um, I've been at Hilltop for 31 years, 31 years. Um, there, um, we are a rural school. Um, about 50% of our students get free and reduced lunches. Um, I started with the GLOBE program this summer, um, going to the class at Defiance College, uh, where we tested the Maumee River, which a lot of our creeks around this area are tributaries to the Maumee. And as Dr. C said, he came out to Hilltop, he showed students how to test, and uh, we were thankful for all the different um, testing materials that we were able to get. Um, every one of our, my students actually was able to hands-on test something, whether it was outside with the turbidity tube or the nitrate testing or the phosphorus testing, each of them did something with it. Um, and then four of my students um, did their science fair project um, with water testing. Um, our science fair was February 8th. Um, we've been doing a science fair at Hilltop for over 50 years. Um, so it's quite ingrained in them that they know that they're going to be doing that. Um, uh, I had uh, Brendan, he was a boy, did it on nitrate, nitrate testing. Um, he did not bring in his water samples very well, so he had a limited amount of, uh, of data with his project, and his research wasn't that great also, but he did complete his project. Um, I had another girl that, um, Amber, who did phosphorus testing, um, and she ended up using most of the data that I had collected um, from a creek near, um, uh, I don't know if you call it a creek, <laughs> it's kind of a ditch um, that runs into the creek that's near our baseball at our park um, in West Unity. Um, and then I had another girl, Taryn, um, and she tested nitrate, yeah, nitrate, nitrate levels of uh, nine different um, creeks around the state of Ohio. Um, so um, her dad actually, through his work, went down to the Ohio River, um, Cincinnati, and got some water from there. Um, her original purpose was try to test creeks that were surrounded by cities versus ones that were surrounded by farmland versus wooded areas. And I don't think she scouted out the places that well. Um, and she, I would have preferred her go back to some of those places and retest later on. We always say at least three samples and she didn't get all three samples, but um, her project ended up um, fairly well. Um, and then um, Brooke, Brooke is one of the three girls um, that I was going to take to Wisconsin to the um, symposium there. We were all excited about going to that. Um, but Brooke tested the oxygen levels at Mill Creek, Mill Creek West Unity Schools. We actually have a creek called Mill Creek uh, right north town. Um, and that actually flows into Harrison Lake State Park. Um, and so she tested oxygen levels at the creek and then um, at, the, at the lake also. Um, so, and she did a really nice job. Uh, she ended up um, doing so well at our local fair that she went on and um, went to the uh, regional science and engineering fair and ended up getting a superior at that fair. So um, she did very well. And then I have two other girls. Um, that at least one of them I know is still taking data. She took a photo of the data and sent it to me the other day. So I will try to get that data of hers uploaded. Um, and who knows when I might see them again um, to get the data together. Usually in the spring, we start um, preparing them for science fair. Every eighth grader at our school does a science fair project. Seventh graders can. I had about five seventh graders do it this year, and Brooke was one of those. Um, but the other seventh grade girls um, were preparing for next year's science fair. Um, so I've told them both, well, keep your data. You can use that data um, and continue on with it. Uh, like I said, we were really excited about going to the Wisconsin fair, but that's not going to happen this year. Um, and I was going to use more of the GLOBE data, as I said, as I started with students. Um, 
usually in April, that's when everybody kind of has to start their uh, science fair projects. Uh, as seventh graders, they don't actually do the testing. Um, but one of the things that's nice with GLOBE is that you can show them data and talk with them about, well, what kind of conclusions could you make? Because um, students tend to jump to big conclusions sometimes and you have to caution them that, okay, well, how much data do we really have here and how much can we can we learn from this? Um, so, so that's one of the things that I was going to do, but like I said, we hadn't, we didn't get time to do that. Um, also, uh, through the GLOBE project, we were given those um, visualization world maps, um, and I used that with each of my eighth grade classes, um, where they took something like surface temperatures, um, and I think there was every, every other month, um, yeah, there were six laminated pictures for each one um and so Abby, i think you're you're talking about the earth system science uh, posters uh, yeah I think. yeah just to put yeah. a name to okay. it and that's uh yeah you can get that through the globe website yeah those were really nice um we did that before those students had to kind of come up with conclusions and look at their data for their own project we kind of looked at that it was nice to work in small groups with that and they were able to see um how what other people kind of thought and then each of the groups um, shared with the whole class then um, and some kind of came up with some other ideas as they shared it with the whole groups so those are the some of the things that we've been doing at hilltop with the um, globe data does anybody have questions i'm using my phone so i can't see on the computer any questions mm -hmm. Well, Anne, uh, I think I saw your hand raised if you wanted to ask a question. I had a question for you, Abby. How can you do GLOBE digitally? Is there any thought to like how for the rest of the school year you can change that all those GLOBE protocols to being without like for the kids at home? Is there any what are you going to do? Well, some of the things that we can try the, the clouds, um, some of that. The other things, I mean, we only have so many of the nitrate, nitrate testing kits and things like that. So um, sharing some of the data that some people have taken, um, that is some of the ideas too. Like I said, my, my girls who were planning on going to Wisconsin, they have kits at their house because they were doing the data. So if they share that data with me, then, then I can share it with the whole class. And, and uh, Abby, I thought it'd be worthwhile if you could talk about how you managed your class um, with, with doing the sampling. Uh, I thought it was a nice approach that you had. Um, you mean when you came that we had samples from several different um, locations? Um, and again, we're a rural area, so I took some from a creek nearby. Um, another from a creek fairly close to where the school was and then the the one at the the park and so as students were taking the data from it um, we put them I don't know if we put it on the smart board some way so then we could kind of um, get averages and you may have, that may have been the next day after you were there um, Dr. C uh, we kind of looked at okay this is what this class got this is what this class did these guys did this testing, um, so let's come up with, with averages. And we talked about how the more data you get and the more times it's tested, the, the more accurate, more reliable you can get. And um, so we did that and then we kind of came up with, okay, well, what kind of water did, would you want to be around? Um, I think the day you came, I actually took some from a ditch near my house too. And yes, so kids actually, they could smell that water. They were like, ooh, this is awful. I thought that was a great uh, approach is to bring a really nasty smelling water. Yeah, yeah. It, it was from a stagnant ditch. Yeah, so I thought that was really well done in that, um, you know, you didn't take all your kids outside. You couldn't do that, right? You couldn't do a field trip, but you brought several different samples into the classroom uh, the only thing was uh, when we did the turbidity tube, we had to go outside to do it so that, you know, because the water splashed around. But you, I know you tried to do it in the classroom originally, 
we did that a few times in the classroom. It doesn't work well when you try to do it in the classroom. It just tends to get messy. You can try putting up a, a big tub underneath the turbidity tube to kind of catch any water that's spilled, but it, it's not that easy to, to do. All right. And uh, Bo uh, had a question or suggestion about using uh, water around the house and gray water even. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Abby. Appreciate that. And uh, I think what we'll do is we'll uh, move on to Meredith Wolf. Meredith is a teacher at Clay High School uh, in Oregon, Ohio. Uh, Meredith? Hi. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Awesome. I've never tried to share my screen before, so we'll see how it goes. Hey, we can see it. Oh. Oh, we saw it for a moment. Did she disappear? I think Meredith disappeared. <laughs> so while she's coming back on, um, I'll share my PowerPoint. Let's see. I won't. Um, I won't make it a PowerPoint, I'll just share. Oh. So let's see. Can you guys see my screen? No, not yet. How's that? And I think Mitch, you're muted, but you're talking. We see it. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, to, to going back to the beginning <laughs> for a minute while uh, Meredith is uh, calling, this project is part of uh, Global Mission Earth, which is a NASA funded project and a NOAA funded project. And you see our partners here and many of the uh, university partners are online and uh, NASA partners. And then our reach map, these are all the <clears throat> schools and universities that we've reached uh, in the United States. Um, so BWET is a Bay Watershed Education Training Program by NOAA. It's for K-12 students. And our project is funded specifically uh, for the Great Lakes. And then um, uh, Amanda Gilbert, who's on the call from Defiance College, she's a co-I on this project. And next year we have funding, or actually this year, starting for the summer, uh, with Mitch from uh, Northern Michigan University and Mike at SUNY Fredonia. So there'll be four of us working together on uh, professional development this summer. And we may be doing a lot of it virtually. We were already planning to share virtually between the four sites, but we may even be doing more. Um, you know, some of the things that I wanted to highlight were the water crisis in Toledo, the algae bloom on Lake Erie uh, in 2014 when the water uh, couldn't be, uh, couldn't drink the water. And we're getting bigger and bigger and brighter algae blooms and those become toxic now. And as Drew had mentioned, uh, phosphorus, phosphates are one of the primary causes. All right, so I was gonna do this whole video PowerPoint thing about, you know, what can you do now that everybody's at home? Well, my wife and uh, youngest son, uh, Timmy, my wife, Kathleen, and I, we went out to the ditch. There was a ton of garbage in the ditch. I was gonna do this whole thing, but then um, NASA is very concerned about promoting students to go outside. Now, I know some of you in rural areas, uh, yeah, you can go out, the kids can go outside and do what we did. But you notice we have, my wife has uh, the plastic gloves on. If you're, you know, we're to have your students go out, they would have to be, properly protected. Uh, you wouldn't want to pick up garbage that might have viruses on it, for instance, um, or not be protected. We had a, a stabber thing, we'd pick up the garbage. Um, so instead, yeah, stay home and save lives. But while you're doing that, you can have peop, uh, scientists do Zoom meetings with your class, just like Jeff Bauman did I think it was yesterday, Jeff, I think it was. So uh, Marley, she has offered to do some, she's from NASA Langley. And there's other scientists uh, who would be willing to uh, work with your classes. And if you let Janet or I know, uh, we can arrange for that, help uh, facilitate that. Um, I'll put Drew on the spot. Maybe Drew might want to do this or be willing to do it. All right, and you know, other topic, it doesn't have to be water quality, it could be invasive species, climate change, lots of different topics we might be able to 
uh, uh, find uh, scientists to share with your class. And we can do it using Zoom. And uh, I think that might be uh, an approach for the next few months. All right, I'll stop sharing. And let's see if Meredith has been able to come back after crashing. Uh, Meredith stated she couldn't hear anything. So I was trying in the chat. Mm. I was trying to. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes. Awesome. Hi. Um, All right, Meredith. Uh, we can switch to you if you're able. OK. I'm OK. I, I want to try this again to see if I can share my screen. I just pushed scare, share screen down at the bottom, correct? Yes. Yeah. And then uh, you left. There's a boxes will come up and click on the one upper left is usually, usually the best. So you have your PowerPoint up and then uh, when you click, click share the screen, then you'll see your desktop. Can you see it? Yeah, yes. yes. Yep, it's there. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Well, my name is Meredith Wolf. I teach at Clay High School, which is in Oregon, Ohio. Um, I'm the Agricultural and Environmental Technologies Program um, instructor, um, which is falls under career, career in tech. Um, I'm also the FFA advisor at Clay. So I was asked to speak because I attended the Great Lakes Watershed Field course. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the stewardship projects that we have going on. So um, the field course um, was hosted by the Inland Seas Association, which is in Sutton's Bay, which if you've ever been to Traverse City, is um, Sutton's Bay is a very little town just north of it, about maybe 15 minutes just north of Traverse City. Um, the program was hosted by um, NOAA's Be Wet program, and I'll talk a little bit about um, what exactly it funded. Um, but um, it was 27 teachers from four different states, I think Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and um, one person from Wisconsin. Um, and that, that was pretty neat because we're still kind of a, a little cohort um, and get together on webinars and um, are invited to go back to Sutton's Bay and talk about our experiences with this program through the year. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this field course um, was. So um, to be accepted, I had to fill out an online application um, it was teachers from all different grades, um, as well as different content areas, which was pretty neat. So some teachers were um, elementary school teachers, while others um, were, I think there were some college professors there as well. So um, it was kind of interesting to be um, mixed up like that. So the, it was kind of, it, the whole program is a progression. So the first thing um, that was done is this four day teacher training. Um, last June um, in Sutton's Bay at the Inland Seas. So their claim to fame is doing schoolship programs. They have um, a large um, schoolship schooner that has um, research capabilities. So they go out on the bay, they take classrooms out on the bay um, to sample microplastics, to put, up, put out trawls to trawl for fish. Um, uh, we sampled benthic organisms, um, all sorts of things on this boat. And then they, while they're on the boat, while we're taking our little cruise, they get to um, analyze the samples and draw some conclusions, which is pretty neat. So um, that four day training, the teachers went up and did it ourselves. Um, then the next thing, um, we uh, or I took um, students to Sutton's Bay in the fall to do the same thing that uh, basically the same thing that the teachers did. Um, we went out on the school ship and did some different activities. Um, then the idea is you take the students home and you involve them in stewardship programs or some place based education. Um, and then the last thing I hope in June we'll get to go back up to Sutton's Bay um, for a follow up. Um, and talk about how the program was and what were our successes and our um, challenges and things like that. Uh, so you can see some of our, our little pictures down below there. Um, I know Janet wanted me to talk a little bit about um, the logistics of this. So I added um, a slide on 
um, how this was funded. So the Be Wet program uh, funded most of this. So it, it funded all of the teacher training program, the housing, the schoolship, all of our activities, our mileage. Um, we can get a grant for a stewardship program or stewardship project um, up to $300 for any stewardship projects that our students ended up coming up with from this program. Um, and then when we went back up to Sutton's Bay with the students, um, they were able to pay for the schoolship program for my students to go out on the boat, which is a, a big cost. Uh, the school funded the bus to get us up there. Um, and then the only thing that students uh, really needed to pay for then was the dorms, which are, can you see my cursor? Yeah, okay. Yes. So the only thing that the students needed to pay for then was the two nights at um, the Inland Seas. So um, these dorms are right at the Inland Seas, right by the school ship. So it's $15 a night. So we say two nights because it's quite a hike up there. So um, they were just redone. We were the first people or the first group of students to stay in there, which was pretty neat. Um, and then as an extra perk, we did an ROV program, a rem remotely operated vehicle program. Um, and we were going to have to pay for that while we were up there, but glo or, um, the BWET program was actually um, wanting to document some of the students' experiences. So we had a, a camera crew follow us um, for our experience and um, we got the ROV program paid for for that. So here is uh, some pictures of our, of our program or our um, experience, our trip. So on the way up, we stopped at uh, St. John's, Michigan at the IQ Hub. Um, it's a fertilizer plant that has a, and I know, kind of touchy subject, but it has a really cool um, museum um, that focuses on good stewardship um, and soil management and best management practices. So that was kind of a nice addition to stop halfway up. Um, then the top picture, top middle pictures, those are the ROV um, program pictures. So they, the students got to do a little, um, kind of like STEM activity and run a real ROV, um, as well as build one of their own to do different challenges, which was really, the students really loved that. Um, and then on the right hand side is the school ship program. Um, I think these guys over here are sampling benthic organisms. Um, these guys are looking for mac microplastics from the mantatrol. Um, and this is the school ship that they got to go out on. They do everything from like hauling in the anchor um, to setting nets to, um, I think some of the kids got to drive, try out their hand at driving, which was pretty cool. Um, and then just on the way home, we stopped at the Platte River Hatchery. The salmon were running at that point and um, just took a little tour. So I added that in there. So um, a little bit more about the teacher training aspect of it. So while we were up there, we had a little bit of um, classroom activities as well. Um, so they focused on the earth force process and place-based education um, to use with students when you get back in the classroom. So it's great that we're exposing them to this, but we want to put um, some citizenship and some stewardship in their hands um, so they feel like they can do something to to change what they're finding. So take the data and do something with it to make your environment better. Um, so I can share this or if you want to jot it down, I don't know if you can click on that and it um, takes you to the website, but um, Earth Force is a, a really cool um, step-by-step -step process that helps teachers set up a stewardship project. Um, some teachers, I think, are overwhelmed um, by setting up a stewardship project, and this, I think, breaks it down in easy-to-use um, processes or steps and um, puts it all in the students' hands. And the students are 
making inquiries and asking questions and making the decision about what they're going to do for their project. So my favorite parts of it, if you're going to just pick and choose little parts of it to use, are the environmental inventory. Kids go out in their environment and um, write down some positives and some negatives about what they see. Um, and basically that walks you through how to choose a stewardship project. So they see the big problems and they pick something to focus on. Um, and then the student led um, issue selection. Um, some of the things that we've done this year, um, some of the things that, some of the things we've had already been doing, but some of them are added um, because of the stewardship projects and my involvement in the Great Lakes Watershed Field Course. So um, we do the Student uh, Watershed Watch Data Collection and Summit. And I think some of you um, on the call are involved in that as well. Um, Phragmites removal, um, storm drain painting, which was unfortunately rescheduled because of the issues that we're going through right now. Um, we did native seed collection, propagation, and planting, which I have a full greenhouse of plants right now and um, the Jerusalem Township Restoration Project. So I can breeze through some of these really quick. We do Student Watershed Watch and I almost didn't include this one, but I think it's important when you're talking about stewardship projects um, to talk about like data collection and then doing something with that data. So um, we get out in the stream at least once every year um, to take <laughs> macro invertebrate samples and um, different water quality parameters and draw conclusions about those. So um, this is our Phragmites removal <laughs> project. Uh, we have a wetlands at our, on our campus, our high school campus. Um, Phragmites are a huge invasive problem, um, especially in our wetlands. So um, this is their project that they um, really narrowed in on from our inventory that I was talking about earlier. So they saw the Phragmites as a big problem. So we went out a couple times um, and removed some Phragmites. They will never forget what Phragmites looks like. Um, storm dream painting, it's on, unfortunately on hold, um, but this is a picture of what it would look like if we were to do that. So um, we worked with a naturalist this year at Maumee Bay to collect, I think it was about six different species of native seeds. Um, we planted them uh, late this winter and this was a couple days ago in my greenhouse. Um, they're lonely, but they're there. Um, so I visit a couple days a week to water. Um, and hopefully we get back to school and they'll be transplanted back to Mommy Bay. Um, and then the Toledo Zoo has prairies, prairie projects with um, our local elementary schools. So hopefully some of these plugs will go to those elementary school prairies. Um, and then a really big one that we're working on, um, our township um, has a very underutilized park. It's basically a big field um, with like some mowed paths. And um, the township trustees um, kind of saw this as um, a missed opportunity, really underutilized and came to us and said, is there any way that you can do something educational out here? So we worked with them to um, lease that park. We worked with um, ODNR to get a plan, you can see it to the right here, um, for a restored wetlands um, with education in mind. It's actually, uh, less than a mile from one of our elementary schools as well. So hopefully they can use it too. Um, and it's recently gained funded um, in conjunction with Ducks Unlimited. So we're just waiting for trustees to sign that and hopefully dig this summer, um, which will be really awesome that we can go out there and do some studies. Um, Janet wanted me to share some ideas with you of things that you can do. This is just a quick list. Um, of ideas, um, but I encourage you um, to 
do the inventory with your students and do the issue selection with your students and you'll be shocked at what like creative projects that they come up with. So um, I did ask uh, Juliana Lisak at um, Inland Seas is the contact for that program. And I did ask her if they're having another program um, in the near future. And they said in 2021 um, is the expected um, next course. So did I breeze through that? Is there any question? Are there any questions? Well, that was a great job, Meredith. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, questions for Meredith? And while we're waiting, uh, you know, if anybody has done stewardship projects, you could post them in the uh, chat box. Oh, can you go back one slide? I want a picture. So that's the idea slide, maybe? Yeah, that sure. one there. Can you see, I pulled this up. Can you see that though? Yeah, it um, has the stewardship ideas on it. Yeah, it's just a quick list of ideas. There's countless ideas. I think one that um, students cling on to a lot is this um, public education um, or awareness of different topics. Um, I know from the Student Watershed Watch, there's been a lot come out about or a lot of findings maybe on like, what's upstream? Why are my, <laughs> why are my readings so bad? So the um, students look upstream to see, you know, maybe there's a dog park or something going on and public um, education or awareness on that is important to fix the problem. Um, what what collaboratives have happened? Like, are there collaborative Zoom classrooms working on their science and talking about some of the ideas that they picked? Because we're thinking about working with trees and squirrels. Or we could work with trees, squirrels, and watershed. And also, I'd love to know native seeds, whether they go in a seed bank, and if you can ask for seeds from a seed bank. Um, I'm not sure about seed bank, the seed bank. We worked with a naturalist at Mommy Bay, um, at, which is a state park in our um, school district. Um, she sits on my um, advisory council. That was a nice contact. And we spent a lot of time talking about careers as well. So it was a neat collaboration to go out there and see what she does. And then um, we spent a class going out and actually harvesting the seed, the students harvested all the seeds um, and then we just put them in our refrigerator over the winter to stratify um, and then planted them in our greenhouse so I teach uh, environment or um, oh my gosh um, environmental and agricultural education so I have a, a fairly large lab um, and a lot of resources I can use to do that which I'm pretty lucky um, normal classrooms don't have that but um, does that help? Does that answer your question? I, I love it. I don't have anything right now. I just brought home my oak trees and saved them from a squirrel, but that's okay. I have a squirrel project with the red squirrel in Ireland, as well as the gray squirrel and the red squirrel in the United States. But um, I just brought home like a, um, a pod that the trees drop where I go, and I've never seen the pods open up. They look now like a duck bill. And they open up, they have sort of floating seeds. So now I'm trying to figure out what to do with a new puppet from that. But I love to find out if Zoom can work with kids talking to kids because they're going to be housebound. So it would be really great if they figure out they could do a water sample at the bottom of a pipe if it rained it in their apartment building and they could run upstairs with it, do something in the sink and report to maybe a, a committed partner and, and let it rest for 24 hours because they're in another time zone and then maybe work with an urban or a rural partner depending on who's the team member and find out you know how could they study something together or maybe one of the kids who's done measurements at the lakes could help the kids that are inside of their houses now yeah it's really interesting i think i think it's opening up pathways that we've never really considered because we didn't have to before so yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting what kids come up with. 
I'm always shocked at what kids come up with. Yeah, I like that idea of having the kids come up with things. I do know that, uh, well, even with my own 11th grade son, that the teacher sends stuff out and the kids don't respond <laughs> with anything. So that is one of the challenges I, I, I get on my own son. Like, you know, you, you need to say something back to the teacher so they know that there are people out there. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, Meredith. Uh, for, uh, Kevin, for, did you yeah. did you want to read the questions in the chat? Well, I thought we should wrap up since it is nine o'clock. Um, there are a few questions in the chat. Um, one from Peter Nelson. Uh, John, do you collaborate with community colleges? Uh, John, are you at Owens? I don't remember where you're from. So. But let me share uh, our contact information. And one of the things I want to, um, before uh, the teachers from Ohio and Michigan, before you log off, uh, Jant and I wanted to talk to you for a minute. Um, I know a lot of, you know, others could uh, jump off if you want. And because uh, we wanted to ask you about like, moving forward um, with, with the Ohio and Michigan uh, locations. All right, so I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. And uh, again, we, our next webinar is actually uh, April 21st on the Urban Heat Island. Jody Haney's students from Bowling Green, I believe, are going to be uh, presenting uh, during that. And I hope you come back. Like I said, Ohio and Michigan teachers, if you want to stay on for a minute, then uh, that'd be great. Hey, Dr. C. Yep. Real, real fast, can I give a shout out to uh, Dr. David Paget on the call tonight for the uh, Ulysses Yes Medal? Congratulations, David. That's awesome. We have to call this. Oh, th thank you. Thank you. You're the man, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So then. Um...